So the subtitle of this talk, The Loom and the Mast, reflects that it's one in a series of conversation we've strived to highlight this year on the rewards and challenges of translating ancient texts. It's generally acknowledged now that not only Homer, but also the tragedians, Herodotus, Pindar, Plato, and even Aristotle at the end of the classical period, among others, occupy a liminal and paradoxical space between the spoken and the written words. But the implications of this liminality and paradox are difficult to reckon with for translators and for readers. In and beyond scholarly circles, it's generally recognized that Homer emerged from an oral tradition, that Plato did not commit doctrines as such to papyrus, that our texts of Aristotle were his notes for public speech. But when all we have are textual remains of public utterances, what does this mean for how we interpret and translate these textual remains? So today we're going to explore this question using as our test case, our thought experiment, the word histos, which literally means standing beam and is the Greek word used for both loom and mast in Homer. And we'll be looking specifically at their appearance in the Odyssey. As we explore them, we'll be holding in our minds, uh, as Re Ray Sperdelin puts it, the fact that Homeric Greeks used a single word for these two objects, mast and loom, suggests that they saw an equivalence between them. And here, I find it helpful also to hold on to the notions of harmony and resonance in a language system. Stella Spantadaki, in her contribution to textile terminologies, observes very often a single term creates semantic harmonies, which produce in the mind of the listener a series of mental associations through its resonances, consonances, and connotations. So we want to be aware of our connotations uh, consonances and resonance, and then also how we diverge and intersect with the ancients. Looking at our mass and loom terminologies, when we speak of a mast, we're referring to the standing beam of a ship, which holds a woven cloth called a histion, the product of a histos, a loom. A beam is made to stand, the verb histemi, um, and histopedes are the feet of both a loom and a mast. So we can see how all these terms are woven together and would potentially invite these associations and harmonies between the, the items themselves, but also how weaving is holding them all together. Uh, and in the Odyssey, the complementarity between loom and mast is beautifully expressed in the description of the Phaeacians in Book 7, just as the Phaeacians are skilled beyond all other men in steering swift ships over the open sea. So their women are equally proficient at the loom, for Athena has given them supreme skill in beautiful works and fine understanding. And here we might notice that skill in beautiful works, the craft of weaving, and supreme skill in fine understanding, in perception and cunning, are yoked together under the authority of Athena. So one conclusion that we might fairly draw, uh, fairly draw is that it's not possible to overestimate the central place of weaving in the ancient Greek mind, not just practically, but for how ancients thought about the world. The cosmos encompassing both the temporal material world ancient Greeks occupied and the eternal metaphysical world to which they understood themselves to belong was itself described as a woven cloth. So we might then say that weaving suffuses the ancient Greeks' understanding of reality itself. Now, we're going to, in Homeric fashion, make a digression to attend to some theories and controversies around translation. And I've chosen these theories specifically because we do tend to hear them invoked in the public discourse around Homeric uh, translation. So uh, we might as well take a little wander through them. Uh, in his experiences in translation, Umberto Eco asks, given a translation from Homer, should the translation transform its readers into Greek readers of Homeric times, or should it make Homer write as if he were writing today in our language? And this question speaks to the debate between two poles, we might say, uh, of approaches to translation, which Lawrence Venuti called the foreignizing approach and the domesticating approach. And that is, should a source in trans, uh, source text in translation be self-consciously aware of itself as such, or should it strive to blend seamlessly into the discourse of the target language? Uh, and Venuti summarizes the difference between these two approaches as either sending the reader abroad for foreignizing and bringing the author back home with domesticating. And for Venuti, 
a concern was for translation not to become, as Nietzsche characterized Roman translation of Greek texts, a form of conquest. And from the way Venuti describes domesticating, uh, it's fairly clear that he comes down on the side of foreignizing. And on the side of domesticating is uh, Eugene Nita, who differentiates between the uh, two forms of equivalence. Formal equivalence focuses on the form and content of the message of itself, and it's associated with literal translation. And functional equivalence is concerned with creating equivalent effects. So the readers of a translated text, he says, should be able to understand and appreciate it in essentially the same manner as the original readers did. And this is best achieved by creating the same effect as the source text, but in a way that contemporary readers can understand. Drawing our attention, though, back to this whole <laughs> taking our standing back and uh, viewing it from, from a large view, we might notice a somewhat glaring problem already in the question, should a translation of Homer transform its readers into Greek readers of Homeric times? I kind of emphasized that the first time I read it, or make Homer write as if he were writing today in our language. And of course, that problem is that Homer was not a writer, and his epics were not generally speaking read by the earliest Greek receivers in the archaic and classical periods. So the terms readers and writers are sort of anachronisms. Even if there was a person called Homer who lived at some point and composed verse narratives that eventually into, evolved into what would become our Iliad and Odyssey, and we, we can't really say, right? <laughs> we don't know, it can't be proven uh, one way or the other, but we, what we have is the earliest references to Homer, and the Homer that we meet in those earliest sources reference him not as a writer of text but as a composer of songs that conveyed stories about gods and heroes from the mythic age who were worshipped in the historical present. And that is the myth ritual connection we often hear referenced. And we could say then that these stories of Homer conveyed sacred knowledge. And to understand what is meant by sacred knowledge, I think I cannot think of a better formulation for the moment than Catalin Partini uh, just, just Catalan Partini's description in Selected Myths of Plato. And that reads, for the ancient Greeks, at least in the archaic phase of the civilization, a myth was a story that unveiled reality, hence a true story. In archaic societies, reality was believed to be the way it is because of the way that gods brought everything into being. The primordial deeds of the gods, those that caused the world around us to be as it is, were out of our reach for they happened at the beginning of time, but they have been preserved in words, in stories that can make us witness them anew. These stories that recreate the very creation of the world by the gods and thus unveil the ultimate origin of reality were called by the ancient Greeks myths. And with these different approaches to our translation in our mind and a sense of what we're translating when we translate Homer, meaning the tradition of retelling sacred truths, we can return our gaze to the exploration of histos, the loom and the mast, um, and consider whether a translation intends in Venuti's terms to send the reader abroad, meaning to make us aware as readers that we're visitors in a discrete cultural universe, or in Nita's terms, make the translated text comprehensible by using uh, frames of reference familiar to contemporary readers in order to create similar effects. Well, to what extent are either of these possible when we're dealing with neither texts nor readers but we're transforming them into texts for readers. <laughs> so to what extent is it possible to replicate in English for contemporary English speakers, what Homer does in Greek for ancient Greeks? And um, not a question that is easy by any means, but of course we might say that's what makes it so rewarding. Um, these two vase images, which Nash and uh, Mary Louise uh, Marie Louise Nash includes in her uh, piece, "The Loom and the Ship in Ancient Greece," recall both of these recall episodes from the Odyssey. Though these images do not specifically reproduce the same scenes, in the scene on the left hand side, Telemachus stands with a spear, bisecting the loom, which holds a partially constructed cloth that evokes. Uh, the sail and mast to which Odysseus is tied in the scene on the right. So though the scene with Penelope and Telemachus is not one that we explicitly see narrated, the two of them interacting in front of Penelope's loom, it does evoke their stat, their st emotional states and mental states throughout the Odyssey, as well as the dynamic between them. He's trying to grow into his authority and Penelope is grieving Odysseus's absence while thinking about how to weave a new scheme to hold off the suitors. Similarly, 
The scene on the right evokes Odysseus's encounter with the sirens, though in our Odyssey, they sing to him from a distance, not flying around his head, as in this one. Um, as in the case of Penelope and Telemachus, the image of Odysseus tied to the mast evokes his state across the epic. He is the standing beam, the mast, the pillar of his family unit. But throughout that the story, he's shackled by the will of the gods that trouble his return home. All three figures in this family unit have to endure and overcome obstacles to achieve their return, and their willingness to do so is what ultimately enables them to fulfill that, re that reunion. So the truth contained in both of these images and in our Odyssey isn't necessarily in the plot elements, what Umberto Eco might call the surface story, but in what he calls the deep story, which here is that each member of this family unit remains connected to that unit. Each is willing to endure, again, whatever suffering is ordained for them in order to be restored to each other. Each draws on his and her capacities and authorities in order to fulfill their reunion. And while their capacities may be uh, in some ways similar, in other ways different, they are equally, as we think about the Phaeacians, necessary and they're complementary. Uh, and we could say that the discourse in which the surface and deep stories are participating is the sacred myth, uh, the vulnerability of humans to eternal forces and the necessity to keep thoughts, emotions, and actions balanced and harmonious with respect to these forces, in harmony with these forces. Uh, so now we could look also at a specific scene from the Odyssey itself. In this one, Penelope in book one, hears Phemius the bard singing a song about the Achaeans' homecomings. And the renowned bard was singing and the men in silence were seated listening. He sang of the Achaeans' homecomings from Troy, which Pallas Athena ordained to be ruinous. In the upper part of the house, she took heed of the god-inspired bard, the daughter of Icarius, prudent Penelope. She came down the high stairway of her house, not alone. Two trusted handmaidens followed her. When she, divine among women, reached the suitors, she stood herself beside the post that held up the solidly made roof, having a shimmering veil over her cheeks. A trusted handmaiden stood on either side of her. Shedding tears, she then addressed the bard of the gods. Phemius, you know many other songs for enchanting mortal men about the works of men and gods who the bards made famous in song. Sing one of these seated among the men as they in silence drink wine, but cease from singing this song mournfully, mournful to me always to the heart in my breast. This song wears it away since unforgettable, insufferable grief came down on me, being reminded that I forever yearn in my mind for my husband, his fame broad throughout Greece and in Argos. Uh, so Penelope wants uh, Phemius to change the song. She doesn't want it to be reminded uh, that the Achaeans' homecomings were ruinous, that many of them didn't make it home or came home and had bad ends because either one of those is still in play for Odysseus. He hasn't come back. He hasn't appeared anywhere. No story has reached her of his having been destroyed. Uh, and if he does come home, the house is overrun by suitors who vastly outnumber him. So she does not want to be reminded of this, of this state which is what the song does. And then of course we have the infamous or famous, <laughs> depending on how you approach it, exchange between Penelope and Telemachus. Uh, Telemachus being prudent spoke in response to her mother of mine, why do you begrudge the faithful bard to delight as his understanding moves him? Bards are not at this time the cause, but Zeus who is everywhere is responsible for he apportions to men who toil, each one according to his will. It is no wonder the bard sings about the Danaeans' bad fate. For mortals bestow praise upon the song that is the newest one to meet their ears. So endure in your heart and consciousness to listen. For Odysseus was not the only one whose day of returning was destroyed by Troy. Many others also were destroyed. But going into the house, take care of your own works, the loom and the distaff, and earn your handmaidens to go to their work. For public speech is the concern of men alone and mine most of all. For might in the house is mine. And Penelope, being in a state of wonder, went back into the house. She placed her child's prudent speech into her consciousness, ascending into the upper part of the house together with her trusted handmaidens. She wept then for Odysseus, her beloved husband, until sleep, honey sweet upon her eyelids, placed owl-eyed Athena. So how do we interpret what is happening here? This description of the bard singing the newest song suggests that the song is in the process of becoming part of the larger tradition. It's not yet established, obviously, since it's new. And whatever happens to Odysseus is neither controlled nor fulfilled by this song. That's up to Zeus the apportioner. And though Telemachus doesn't explicitly state this, the implication is that the song can still be shaped. So he's saying, don't worry about this song. Uh, our song, 
of Odysseus returning home and us being reunited is still in play. He's saying, his, he says out loud that Odysseus was destroyed. But at the same time, he's telling Penelope to go back to her loom and distaff and her loom being her medium of cunning and the, the medium that she used to hold off the suitors. So that Penelope recognizes his speech as prudent and absorbs it into her understanding, suggests that it's not the scolding dismissal we moderns might hear it as, but a cipher that's concealing Penelope's agency to control the story with her weaving. She delayed the completion of the shroud, forcing events to remain in a suspended state, effectively stopping time. And Telemachus' speech conceals Penelope's narrative power, both from us modern readers who are outside of this tradition, but also within the story from the suitors who are witnessing this exchange and who are portrayed as disconnected from the cosmos order. So here we can pause to think about the connection between weaving and storytelling in classical Greek sources. I've sort of made this grand claim, right, that it is uh, their understanding of reality. So let's just look at a few other places in Greek sources from the classical period where uh, this connection between weaving and song is highlighted. And one of those is in Euripides' Ion, when the chorus arrives at Delphi and recognizes a story on the temple. See, look at that, the hydra of Lernea that he slew, the son of Zeus with his golden sickle. Look at your two eyes, dear ones. I see, look with your two eyes, dear ones. I see beside him another lifting a torch blazing with fire. Is he from the myth told to me as I thread my spool? The worry Earl Laos, who took up in common the labors of the son of Zeus. Um, so clearly they're seeing a story and they're recognizing that it's connected to the one that they wove, right? So connecting these two different technologies, weaving and building <laughs> architecture. Uh, and then in Euripides is Hecuba, Hecuba says, or wonders, or in the city of Pallas, shall I represent in my weaving on the saffron peplos, the horses of Athena with their beautiful chariot with elaborate flower dyed wefts, or shall I represent the race of the Titans, which Zeus destroyed with his fiery blast? And this is Anthony Tuck's translation. Uh, again, noticing here that the chorus leader, um, or sorry, that Hecuba is pondering, what story should I weave? What story should I tell? Uh, and we know, of course, that this isn't necessarily plot specific, but has to do both with the discourse, the, the relationship between gods and heroes, and also the deep story of what which actually of these narratives do I want to reproduce? Uh, and then in Iphigenia in Taurus, again, we have this dynamic between story and weaving recurring and this exchange between Orestes and Iphigenia. I will, and the, this is also Anthony Tuck. I will say first the things I have heard from Electra. Do you know of the strife of Atreus and Thyestes? I have heard of it. The quarrel concerned a golden ram. Didn't you weave these things in a fine textured web? Oh, dearest one, you're coming near my heart. And the image of the migration of the sun on the loom, I wove that form also in a web of fine threads. So stories can be told and we know that the story can take different forms. Uh, and what does Anthony Tuck make of this ultimately? Uh, if myths retold, and this is very We'll, we'll unpack this a little bit. If myths retold while weaving incorporated embedded, embedded numerical devices related to textile patterning, and if the patterns produced were sometimes episodic images of myths, might then the ritualized numerical organized means of retelling specific narratives, for example, the gigantomachy, distinct from other modes of storytelling, have actually produced a garment showing the same story? Um, so what he's noting for us interestingly for us, is that weaving is not just a metaphor for storytelling. And so this is where the significance of Penelope using her loom to control time comes in. Songs sung while weaving could possibly hold patterns for weaving. And the story that was the subject of the song was perhaps the one produced on the cloth. So not just a metaphor, but a technology, the story, that weaving is a technology for storytelling uh, and that it's quite a sophisticated technology because it incorporates song and movement as a way to ingrain in you the story and the story that you're hearing, you're filtering it through your body and it's coming out in your hands and through your hands being rendered on the cloth. So a very deep connection between weaving and storytelling, not just a way of understanding, but a way to live it bodily. 
I hope that makes sense. <laughs> you can ask questions at the end. Um, so uh, we can recall here in the Odyssey, Circe at her loom in book 10. Um, here are Odysseus's companions. They're standing outside among these tame beasts. Um, and they stood at the outer doors of the lovely haired goddess and could hear Circe indoors singing in her sweet voice and moving back and forth at her great immortal loom, weaving the kind of delicate, bright, and graceful stuff that goddesses make. Um, so again, Homer isn't describing the suitors, uh, sorry, the companions seeing Penelope weave, um, Circe weaving, um, but they hear her song and they know from the song that she must be weaving. So that seems, again, a very significant little detail that might escape our notice because we're not used to making this connection on all these different levels between uh, weaving, singing, storytelling, um, and movement. So now, Penelope's histos is the means by which she stalls the suitors to leave Odysseus time to return. Odysseus's histos, in the same way, is the means by which he survives the slaughter of his companions by Zeus, the compensation for their slaughter of Helios's cattle. Odysseus survives the storm to live another day and continue his journey home. So while Penelope's histos suspends time, Odysseus's histos enables him to return to the flow of time. So opposites kind of collapsing together to create a shared outcome. And um, in book five, we see Odysseus craft his, his raft. And so he worked away, fixing a platform onto it, joined it into close set ribs and finished it off with long gunwales. In the vessel, he set a histos, a mast, with a yard arm fitted to it. And after that, made a steering oar with which to guide the raft. And then later in book 12, as he's recounting to the Phaeacians, the final destruction of his uh, companions and also their ship. Um, he says, while I kept moving about the ship, uh, meanwhile, I kept moving around the ship after all the companions are thrown overboard. He's continuing to wait to move around until a wave tore her sides from the keel, which stripped of planking was carried along by the swell. It had snapped the mast off at the keel, but the backstay made of oxide had fallen over it. And this I used to lash the keel and the mast together. Sitting astride these, I was borne away by deadly winds. And what an image that is. Um, Odysseus basically riding his histos <laughs> like uh, in order to survive. I mean, again, if we're thinking about all these associations with histos, that's it's quite a lot that's coming together. And he's desperately trying to hold on um, to his forward motion, right, to his ability to stay in the world of time, in the temporal world. And Charybdis at this time, uh, was sucking down the sea's salt water, but I swung myself upwards toward a tall fig tree. Again, a standing, we could say a standing beam of a sort, and although not a histos, uh, and held firmly to it, clinging like a bat, but I could nowhere plant my feet firmly nor climb up it because its roots were a long way below and its branches hung far above my head. A bat clinging <laughs> uh, and not falling, refusing to fall, again, contrasts really uh, sharply with the uh, suitors who are described in book 24 as squeaking bats who have lost their hold and are now going to be led into the underworld. So very stark contrast um, because its roots were a long way below and its branches hung far above my head. The enormous long branches that overshadowed Charybdis. Still, I hung on grimly until she should spew up the mast and keel again. And when the mast and the keel come out again, he falls onto them, again, clings to them, does not let go, and is eventually washed up on the shore of Calypso. So again, the histos, the mast, is what enables him to survive the slaughter of the com companions and live another day to continue that. Um, this is what I get. I love these. These are really, really interesting. And I, I don't mind. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. So um, returning now to Nash. Uh, she argues that ships and looms are connected cognitively, functionally, terminologically, and technologically. We've sort of tried to explore that a little bit, and now we're going to bring her in to just give us a little bit of a uh, insight into that. And while in modern times, she says, naval construction and weaving are distant technologies, uh, likewise, textile and naval 
terminologies are quite often foreign to most modern ears and minds. And she also notes that um, recent research has begun to demonstrate how weaving is connected with other crafts in antiquity. Uh, weaving is often found in works of philosophy connected to singing and narrating. And it has also been shown that textiles can share both cognitive and terminological features with mathematics, astronomy, and cosmology. So as I said at the beginning, it, I don't really believe we can overestimate the centrality of weaving in the Greek, how the Greeks conceptualized reality. Concerning the ship and the loom specifically, a sample of striking examples that Nash provides include the textiles and textile fibers were used in naval construction for rope and caulking. Uh, some ancient boats were stitched together. That's the image you're looking at on the right. You can kind of see where the stitching is. And of course, sails are made from cloth and wood is used to craft looms. Um, we're looking at an image of a, a classical image of a loom. Loom weights and ship anchors are both weighted devices for holding rope in tension, and both are pyramidal in structure. And so, again, if you just look at the loom image, we can kind of see those little triangles at the bottom are the loom weights, and that's the same shape that anchors had. And of course, anchors would have been connected to rope as loom weights are connected to string. So we can start to see all the resonances. Uh, and as I mentioned, I uh, earlier, the feet of a loom and the feet of a mast are both called histopedes. Weaving swords and oar blades are both called a spathi or a sword. And the bodily movements uh, made while weaving, rowing, and sailing are similar as they are with fighting. Uh, and Nash ultimately suggests that the gendered and symmetrical expressions in Homer rest upon an underlying and deeper commonality, suggesting that the development of the sailing ship may be based on technologies and practices taken from weaving on the warp-weighted loom. So the warp-weighted loom as a sort of origin of all these other technologies and all ways of thinking about the world. Now, uh, the scene that we looked at from book one, we have a repetition in a varied form of that scene in book 22, just before Odysseus begins the slaughter of the suitors. Oh, sorry, that should be 21. My apologies. <laughs> book 21. Um, Telemachus responds to his mother with almost the exact same words as we hear in book one, and Penelope's response is rendered in the exact same language. So Penelope says, ah, Telemachus, well, actually what happens is Odysseus has asked in his beggar disguise to have a go with the bow. And uh, the suitors, of course, are furious, and Penelope asserts that he should be given a chance. And then Penelope responds to her saying, but Telemachus being prudent, spoke in response to her. Mother of mine regarding the bow, no one of the Achaeans besides me has more power over who I wish to give it and also to deny it. Neither as many as our lords throughout rocky Ithaca, nor as many islands toward horse nourishing Elis. Of them, none will constrain me against my will until, unless I should will it to be so once and for all for anyone to give the foreign friend this bow to bear. But going into the house, take care of your own works, the loom and the distaff, we'll find this familiar, and urge your handmaidens to go to their work. The bow is the concern of men alone and mine most of all. So where the point of contention in book one is the um, public speech, here it is the contest of the bow. Uh, as we know, the bow is connected to the lyre, both are associated with Apollo, on whose feast day the contest of the bow is held, and the lyre is connected to epic song. So now Odysseus is going to bring <laughs> the song, the epic, to fulfillment by using the bow to slaughter the suitors. So we can see how everything is woven together and everything comes full circle. And where in book one, Telemachus was taking control or authority over public speech, and telling Penelope to keep her schemes hidden. Um, now he's taking control of the bow. So public speaking and uh, might being the domains of men and counsel, which is by necessity held in secret. You don't reveal all of your strategies publicly, uh, remains in the domain of Penelope. And so when he tells her to go back to her loom and her distaff, maybe she's not going to be literally weaving a, weaving a strategy but she has to keep, but the loom is, of course, inherently associated with strategy. And so he's reminding her, we've got to be strategic here. And Penelope receives 
this speech in the same exact way that she received his speech in book one. In a state of wonder, she returns to the, to the house, placing her child's prudent speech into her consciousness. Uh, right. So <laughs> um, that is sort of, I hope, bringing everything full circle. And I have a few uh, questions for us to discuss and explore over the next, um, the rest of the time that remains for us. If anybody is watching this in the future, they're also welcome to put any questions, comments, observations, connections into the into the comments or to reach out to us. We're always happy to uh, to help and contribute. So I'm going to have us stop the recording now.